welcome to the evening service. We're glad that you're here. I trust you're here to worship God. David, the psalmist, wrote, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He's my God, my strength in whom I trust. And he goes on to say this, because of this, um, I'll call on the Lord, right? I'll call on the Lord and, and who, and sorry, lost my place there. <clears throat> I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I will be saved from my enemies. I love the Lord. You tonight, let's catch a new vision of him tonight as we look back as it, the psalmist did, does and says, look what God has done. Therefore, I'm going to call on him. I'm going to praise him, worship him tonight. Will you just stand with me as we um, tune our hearts in to hear from his voice tonight? Let's begin our prayer just by singing that chorus, I love you, Lord, and praying to him, I love you, Lord. Father, we love you tonight for all the good things you have done for us, but most of all for who you are. You are our strength, our deliverer, our God, the one we put our faith and trust in, and you are worthy to be praised. So tonight we come to you in worship. We look back and remember all that you have done, but as we look forward into this new week, remember you are the God who loves us and the God who is with us. And so tonight we come to you with hearts of worship with hearts that are open to hear from you. May you be pleased and honored in all that is said and done here tonight, we pray. Come and speak to us, move among us, we ask. Amen, amen. You may be seated, but join in the singing as Brandon comes to lead us. Now this is not his fault, I didn't warn him, but I want you to stand for the first song. Hymn number 84, hymn number 84, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, I'll let you sit down after the first hymn. Here we go.
wants, you can turn to hymn number 383. Hymn number 383, satisfied all my life long, I had panted for a drink from some cool spring. Let's sing it. All my life.
Amen. Is he your true heart's desire tonight? The psalmist reminds us that we seek after God. This is what God calls us to do. He will be found. He will fulfill that desire. When we truly come after him, he waits for us with open arms. And so tonight we come uh, in prayer because God has invited us to come boldly. And so let's do that, continuing in worship. I invite you as we pray together, will you praise God tonight? Remember what he has done and think of, of things just this week that he has done. Let's not be, uh, be delinquent <laughs> in giving him the praise that is due his name. So join in, pra in praising him. And then we want to bring our petitions. There are many represented here in the congregation. And you may know of those just around you who need prayer. Let's lift them to our good father. There are many who are struggling with cancer and illness and these sorts of things that we want to pray about. Some physical needs represented here in our congregation. We want to remember John Shamber, who is very low. Uh, for Aaron Hamilton, who will be facing surgery on Friday, we want to pray for him and for his family. Janelle Keaton, in hospice care and very low for Sherilyn Marshall as well for she and her family just that God will wrap his arms of love and comfort around them in this difficult difficult time we want to pray for uh, brother Bill Saxton facing some tests and things this week uh, working or dealing with some physical issues uh, also Wilmary uh, Lopez the AutoZone manager we want to lift uh, from our community lift um, to Christ. So let's trust him as the great healer in all of these needs. And there are many on the list who I haven't read out tonight. We also think of the world in which we live, the conflict in Israel and uh, Haiti and Ukraine. Uh, we serve a big God, the Prince of Peace. And we want those in, the, in this difficult situation out of this to find his peace. Let's remember our sister organizations here on our campus as they restart school this week. Uh, many still traveling in the next day or two that God would give them safety and travel and, and um, uh, help us we restart and finish up school in the last few weeks. And for our HIM, our mission sending organization, right here on our campus as well. I know the Galts just returned safely to Lesotho. I saw the Teeds walk in tonight. God's kingdom work all around the world. We want to support it with our prayers. Uh, so join in this evening as Brother Harold Martin comes and leads us in prayer. Will you just join in, in along? Let's stand together and talk to our good Father. Let's pray together tonight. Lord Jesus, we come to you very aware of our need for you. We need your presence, Lord, and we just thank you for your presence that we have felt throughout this day the way you've been with us, with us, Lord, and we just thank you for that. We thank you for the message this morning on your mercy, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for uh, that you ever sought us out and, and, uh, and have made such a change in our lives, Lord, and we have a reason to live. We have a hope for the future, and we have meaningful work to do while we're here on this earth. Lord, thank you so much for the many, many things that we take for granted, and we just pray that you'd be with this service tonight. You'd be with Pastor Ellison, make it easy to preach. Be with Brandon, make it easy for him to lead us in singing and just that every single part of this service Lord will be touched by your presence we do want to thank you for this uh, past week even at IHC and your presence that was there and uh, the many 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 miles that were traveled by many and several coming back even now we just pray that you would be with them and keep them safe we pray for the remainder of this school year as we go into these next uh, five or six weeks as things wrap up for this year Lord be with President Malloy and each faculty and staff member each graduate that's uh, just just working so diligently to complete their course of studies here be with them lord we pray even in these next few weeks and next few months we also want to think of our nation lord tonight we're just we're just heartbroken by the things we see and yet lord we know that we serve a good god nothing catches you by surprise and you're working even in the midst of the turmoil in our world but we do pray for our president our vice president our congressmen our senators our judges as we're commanded we also pray for our local officials, Lord. May they work uh, for your glory and your honor, we pray. We do pray for Israel. We're commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we do that tonight, Lord, and we thank you for your protection over that nation last night in this unprecedented attack on their sovereignty, and, let, and yet, Lord, we know 
that uh, there are so many in that region that do not know you, that are blinded by false religion, Lord. And we just pray, even tonight, Lord, that you'll grip their hearts. We know you're working all across the Muslim world, Lord, and the men and women are having visions and dreams, and you're revealing yourself to them. And we pray that you would even continue to do that even now, Lord. And particularly, we thank in the nation of Iran, Lord. But we thank you for your protection, even this last evening on Israel. And you'd continue to give wisdom to the world leaders as they deal with this situation. We do. Thank you for HIM, Hope International Missions, and all that you're doing around the world. A lot of movement at this time of the year with uh, home assignment beginning for many and exploratory trips around the world, various places. We ask for safety. We ask for fruit for our labors. We ask for, for continued provision, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing through the world of Hope International Missions and so many other organizations doing like work around the world. Thank you for our church, Lord. We pray you be with Pastor Ellison as he leads us. Continue to be with each staff member and, and just each uh, pastor and each especially think of our families, Lord. Each of the fathers of our families, may we lead well and may we just continue to serve you here, Lord, and hope sound of the best of our abilities. We thank you for an empty tomb. We thank you for a full gospel and a power of your resurrection that enables each of us to live a godly life. We do want to close by remembering so, so many dealing with just intense physical needs, Lord, and we can't imagine the burdens that many of them are under, Lord, and so all of those that are perhaps even near death now, Lord, we pray that you would be faithful to them during this time. If you would heal them, we would certainly give you the glory and the honor, but Lord, be faithful and near to them even at this time. Many others, Lord, who have surgery this week, we think especially of Dr. Hamilton, Lord, would you be near him? Would you be near the doctors? Would you be near his family as he undertakes this very, very critical surgery, Lord? Give him good health, we would pray. And many, many others that we could think of tonight, Lord. Just give comfort, give help, give strength. May we serve you faithfully. We know you're coming soon. May we live lives that are glorifying and honoring to you, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. His eyes on the sparrow, and if he cares so much about the little birds, how much more does he care about his children? Amen. So good to have Paul Stetler home, and he had a little snafu, and uh, it looks like he's going to be around for a few more days. Had a, there was a little mix-up in some schedule, and so good to have him around, I think, for another week. And uh, thank you so much for that offertory this evening. Thank you so much for your giving, and uh, may God bless you. As we, as we think about uh, money and giving, I was thinking of talking with uh, Frank Vaughn uh, before the service this morning, and I was asking him about Pastor Dominic, and, uh, you know, there's always something. There's just there's another snag to, to face or to go through, and from my understanding, 
that uh, apparently he's free to go if he can raise U.S. dollars, $12,000. Is that correct? Piece of cake. And uh, when, when fuel and everything else over there is so high and scarce and, and the yearly income is so low, if he can come up with 12000 U.S. dollars, he's free to go. Well, from my understanding, the people there in Haiti have the people there together have raised, I think, close to $6,000 towards that effort. And I think it'd be good for us to just keep praying that God would help this mountain to become a molehill and, and his freedom would be granted and no more snags along the way. And so just keep that as a matter of prayer before you in these next few days that God would just undertake and do something very special for Pastor Dominic. So just, that's just another money-related issue, but, but I know God is able to meet that need, so let's pray there. As, as we think of this week, Tuesday is our, our church board meeting, 7 o'clock in the, in the boardroom upstairs. And then, just keep in mind, ladies, May 11th, 5 p.m. is going to be the ladies' banquet. And uh, just, just, to arrest, uh, just to arrest anyone's ease, uh, the little pink flamingo in the bottom there, we are not supporting Florida Lottery. We are, we are supporting uh, our women's, uh, Women of Worth ladies meeting. So keep that in mind. There's not going to be a big raffle there, but go and enjoy some wonderful time together. Uh, tickets can be purchased at the church office or the campus post office Monday through Friday or whenever that post office is open. And, uh, and so you have the information there. If you have any questions, you can call the office at any time and we'll uh, be sure to get back with you or answer the questions that you may have. So keep those things in mind. I believe at this time, uh, the Hintons and Gideon Stentz is going to be ministering song. Lord bless them as they minister. For sunny days That the sky above us Would never turn gray But life isn't always sunshine We have times that leave us asking why And when the clouds roll in And tears begin to fall
and hope to our heartache, healing out of every hurt that invades our shattered world. We never walk through trials in vain. Oh, we've known His mercy long enough to say. song and what a beautiful reminder again we can trust him and uh, he knows what he's doing and because of the fallen world in which we live so many things happen in our life but I'm glad that he is a redeemer of all things and he's able to take uh, the worst of things and bring something beautiful from them amen Romans chapter 12 is where we're looking again this evening Romans chapter 12 and uh, we're going to uh, look at the second verse uh, here this evening and uh, try to finish up where we started this morning. Concluding a sermon we started based out of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I believe these two verses hold a crucial message for us all. And, and I hope this morning that we, we took away from uh, the, the message just the beautiful thought that uh, because of his mercy, because of his mercy, he deserves our everything. And uh, tonight, uh, we want to continue on to verse 2. And uh, we're spared from God's wrath, and in return, we're called to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God, a life dedicated to honoring and glorifying him. I love the, the words, again, a songwriter wrote, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily, I'm constrained to be. Let that grace, Lord, like a fetter, like chains, may it bind my yielded. I like that, not forced, not pushed or shoved, but Lord, may it bind my yielded soul, my heart to thee. Let me know thee in thy fullness. Let me know everything there is about you, Lord. Guide me by thy mighty hand till transformed in thine own image, in thy presence, I shall stand. These words go along with our text found in Romans 12 verse 2 that simply says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you might discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. The ultimate goal of our lives, as we've mentioned as a Christian, is that we would bring honor and glory to our Creator, God. And the only way that we can achieve that is, is by understanding and obeying, walking in obedience to the will of God. And uh, I, I think it would be safe to say that, that it's hard to really, truly live this out in obedience uh, if we don't understand uh, what it is that we, we're called to. I know it sounds easy enough in theory, but as Christians, we want to know. It's, it's just a given. We want to know God's will so that we can obey it, so that we can walk in it. I don't understand. I'll just be honest. I don't understand somebody who professes to love God with all of their heart, but yet just kind of always groan under the leadership of God in their life. The Holy Spirit trying to work in their life, trying to lead them in their life, and they're always groaning and complaining and, and you know, all sorts. I don't understand that mindset it because I believe in the heart of a true Christian, there's something inside of our heart that says, Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know everything about you that I might live a life that's pleasing to you. Not in this fear of, Lord, am I pleasing you enough? Am I doing enough? Are you happy enough? But no, Lord, that I just might know who you are. And the more that I know of you, the, the, the more I just want to follow after you. I'm glad that we can have a heart that says, Lord, I just want to follow you 
you. I want to serve you. I want to obey you. I want my life to be pleasing to you. We desire to present our whole bodies. It's not a chore, but we desire to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. I think as a Christian, there could be no debate about it. That must be the passion and the heartbeat deep within us. We cannot be uh, Christians without a deep desire to know God in his fullness, know his will, and a desire to obey him in whatever he shows. We just, I, I think that it's just hard biblically to say that we can be a Christian and desire anything less than knowing God, his will, and saying, God, I want to embrace it and I want to walk in it. I would suggest that this verse is, verse one is, is not really the holdup that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Sometimes I think the difficulty is found in verse two when it says that we are not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might discern the will of God, that we might know what is good and acceptable and perfect. Anybody else at times find it difficult along the way, on occasion, not always, but on occasion, to maybe discern what the will of God is. But I'm glad that we have a faithful God and the Holy Spirit that is there to walk with us and to guide us and to lead us. In his book, General MacArthur recalled a, a strategy that he carried out while he was enrolled at West Point. Here's what he said. The first section studied the time-space relationship later formulated by Einstein in his theory of relativity. The text was complex, and because I was unable to comprehend it, I committed the pages to memory. When I was called upon to recite, I solemnly reeled, all, reeled off almost word for word what the book said. Our instructor, the Colonel Feinberger, looked at me somewhat quizzically and asked of him, do you understand this theory? It was a bad moment for me, he said, but I didn't hesitate in replying, no, sir. You could have heard a pin drop, he said. I braced myself and waited, and then the slow words of the professor said, neither do I, Mr. MacArthur, class dismissed. We live in a world where we have no problem committing information to memory, most of which is short term. We commit a bunch of memory. I remember as a student, I, you know, I would cram. I, I, I unfortunately was not the diligent one that, you know, I, I know a, a test is coming three weeks down the road. And so I, I took 10 minutes of each night to go over and go over and go over. And so that when it came time for testing, man, it just, it was not me. I would wait till the night before, after ball was done and, and after, you know, all of the fun stuff was done and then burn the midnight oil and I would cram all sorts of information in my brain and then get there and try to get a passing grade, a, a decent grade to sound somewhat impressive. But still, at the end of the day, I would say to us, there's a big difference of committing information to our memory and, and really getting a grasp and understanding what that information is. We can memorize the entire Bible if we will. I don't know how many would remember Brother, uh, Brother Earl Newton. Man, that, that, that was a, a man who had committed so much of Scripture to memory. He held several different revivals up, up in the north area where we were. And, and I don't know that I ever remember Brother Stetler a time that he opened his Bible. He always carried his Bible and he would quote, chapters at a time word for word for word for word it was a beautiful thing it was it was it was a shameful thing for people sitting there thinking man uh i always chose jesus wept but here he is man he's quoting chapter after chapter but we can memorize the entire bible and still struggle in discerning the will of God because it's more than just knowing and cramming information. The most important thing is we need to know personally the author of the information. 
One of the great hindrances to fulfilling the command in verse 1 of living a life of worship, I believe, is found in this realm. realm. Many can quote Scripture and maybe even give a brief, shallow explanation of it, but I would say that fewer know how to understand it and apply it because they know the author of it. God is not impressed about how much Scripture we can commit to our memory. As much as He is, is how much we know Him and be able to understand it because we know Him and apply it to our lives. And this is the part that I would like for us to deal with this evening. How can we discern the will of God? What is it that's going to be pleasing to God? What is right? What is acceptable? What is His perfect will for us? What is it that is going to help us to live a life of sacrificial living, completely surrendered to Him, pleasing to Him in all things? Lord, I want to know that in my life. I believe it begins with verse 2 at the very beginning where it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Living a life in step with God's will begins inwardly, ladies and gentlemen. It begins inwardly. It's in the way that that we uh, allow God to change our thinking, the way that we see things, how He views things. When we can allow the Lord to to transform us by the renewing of our mind and we can say, Lord, I want to see things as you see them. I want to see people as you see them. I want to see problems as you see them. I want to see reverses and things in life as you see them. If God can help us to see them from His point of view, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that is is a key element of of living and, and, and walking in step with Him. Most generally, when the, word world, when the word world is used in the New Testament, it's dealing with a world system, or, or maybe we could say this, it's dealing with how really every human being, every one of us here, how we would live by default how we were born. We were born with a nature in us that is bent towards sin and making it easy for self to be first and and everything else to be first and and God way back somewhere else. It's that's how we were we're born. It's what we're that's what we're kind of uh, uh, given in, in this life. John describes the worldly way of living as, in 1 John 2, 16, having the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. By instinct, we all chase these things. By instinct, by default, we chase these things in pursuit of happiness and contentment and and meaning. It's just our natural default. We think that pleasure and possessions and status, those are the things that mean most. Those are the things that are going to really bring about a sense of satisfaction and and help and and, and, and joy and happiness and, and all of those things. That is what it's all about. The desire of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life. Pleasure, possessions, and status. But I'm here to tell us that that's the world system. That's the way the world is. And and Romans 12, 2 says, listen, don't be conformed to that system. Don't be allowing yourself to chase after all of those things, thinking that if you reach a certain peak and a certain point, that's going to be your pinnacle of satisfaction and happiness. Often this passage is used, when it is used as a text, it is used to launch a message about all things worldly. Somewhere in the message from this text, you're probably going to get a list of worldly things that you ought to refrain from. Here's where I would like for you just to hear me clearly and listen closely just for this point. Then you can go back. I am 100% in favor of careful, cautious living. Do we get that? I am 100% in favor of careful and cautious living. If you miss that point, everything else can get skewed and be misquoted. So 
I want it to be on record that I'm 100%, in case you didn't get it, in favor of careful, cautious living. I believe the spirit of carefulness and caution is at the heart of every true believer endeavoring to serve God. I believe there is just a spirit inside that says, I want to be careful in my living. I want to be careful that I don't mar the name of Jesus. I want to be careful that I don't bring negativity to his name. I want to be careful that I represent Christ well. And I believe that there are several scriptures that could speak to this matter. But folks, if we take this passage to mean that to live a life that is a living sacrifice to God means that we must follow a list of rules of do's and don'ts, rules and regulations, we find ourselves trying to control the peripherals rather than to fix the root of the problem. Again, understand, I'm all for living carefully before God. But friends, uh, 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 being worldly from this text is not this long list that, that so many, we could, we, could, we could put books out there of what is worldly and what is not worldly. But what it is trying to say is, listen, if you're going to get past that and fix the problem, the foundation of the problem, we've got to put that aside for a moment and say, Lord, I need you to transform me, first of all, by renewing renewing my mind. Let me get that right. And if we can get our mind right with God and see things as he sees them, I promise you the peripherals begin to take care of themselves. We can repaint the trim all we want to. We can replace the windows and we can repair the roof. But if the foundation is faulty and it is not fixed, all the work that we put into the house of fixing up is sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, going to come crashing down. God is always more interested in first fixing the foundation and then allowing everything else to fall into place. And if we're going to follow Christ... If we're going to live a life of a living sacrifice to him, we have to say, Lord, help me to get the foundation fixed. Lord, would you transform me through the renewing of my mind? Lord, get me away from the possessions and the status and, and, uh, and all of those things and help me to understand from your point of view that it's, about, uh, it's not about living, but it's about dying to self. It's about dying to people. It's about dying to everything else and coming alive to Christ and saying, Lord, your will be done. Where you lead, I'll follow. What you ask, Lord, I'll do. Who cares what anybody else says about it, Lord? I'm just going to follow your will, your way. No matter if anybody else can, cannot do it, Lord, if I can see it from your perspective, then, oh, God, that's going to help me to serve you with joy and happiness in my life. Many desperately, I believe, want to enjoy the peace that passes all understanding. They want to have the joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. However, they continually to struggle to obtain it because they are constantly addressing the peripherals rather than the heart of the problem. We can avoid all kinds of worldly behaviors and still not be transformed in our heart and our life. That must be dealt with first and foremost if we're going to live a life that's pleasing to God. Before we can passionately live a life of worship that God desires us to live, we must undergo a massive rewiring project in our mind. We must understand the context and its true meaning of our text. Do not be conformed to this world and its system, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind, that by testing you might discern the, what the will of God is, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect, what is right. We can know what God wants for us, what is good and acceptable. We can know, but we have to first allow God to fix the foundation of the problem. Paul tells us to abandon the chase for pleasure and possession and status. Stop living like everyone else. And instead, he urges us to be transformed from the inside out. Specifically, he writes to us that we change how we think, having our minds renewed so that we can begin to understand things from God's perspective. 
We cannot understand God's will for our lives while operating under the world's world system. The mind, let me we be reminded, is the battlefield that needs to be conquered. The devil is defeated if we submit our minds to God's transforming power. Someone once stated that we, need to, we, we, we must let the mind of the master be the master of our mind. And friends, that cannot happen without submitting ourselves to the transforming power of God. Transformation is not switching from a to-do list of flesh to the to-do list of the law. Paul, when he replaces this to-do list of the works of the flesh, he does not replace it with the works of the law, but he replaces it with Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the Spirit. The transformation is what leads us to enjoy the living, uh, enjoy living the Christian life as a living sacrifice to God. The Christian life, though it is utterly submitted and, and enslaved, Romans 6, 8, and 10, and, uh, and as tells us about submitted and being enslaved to the revealed will of God. That, my friend, is how the New Testament describes that we can be radically free. There's freedom and no knowing that we're enslaved to the will of God and we're no longer chained to ourself and the world's world system of thinking. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Galatians 5, 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. No, we've submitted to the yoke of liberty and freedom when we put on God's yoke, friends. People in the world think we're just nuts. We're just crazy. Why would you go down that road? But once you've tasted and you've seen that the Lord is good and you've tasted and seen that it is what it is, friends, we find that in His way there is freedom, there is liberty, there is joy, there is peace, there is happiness, there is contentment. You're free in Christ because when you do from the inside what you love to do, you are free. If what you love to do is what you ought to do, and that's what transformation means. When you are transformed in Christ, you love to do what you ought to do. For instance, that's freedom. That's being able to say, Lord, I'm going to present my body as a living sacrifice because it's my reasonable service because of mercy. Lord, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. Does it mean that we're going to face some difficult times, go through some pain, face some persecution? Friends, yes, all of those things are possibilities in the life of a Christian. And matter of fact, to be expected as, as, as we would read in the Gospels in the New Testament. But ladies and gentlemen, even in the prison stocks, do you remember Paul and Silas? They were in jail and they could have been all bent out of shape and distorted in their, in their attitude. But guess what? It said long about midnight, they began to sing and they began to praise God. How in the world could they do that? Because they were free in Christ Jesus. When we can get this right, the foundation right, the peripheral things can be adjusted and fixed into a, in a meaningful and a delightful way. Preaching, teaching, and discipling against worldliness without connecting it to the renewing of our mind can be damaging and harmful in the long run. Let us understand that when our minds are not renewed, these peripheral things become hard, tiresome, and just another form of bondage in our life. But when we connect it, we do what we do. We live the way we live because God is on the throne. Because this is the mind and the will of God. Friends, I want to tell you, all of a sudden things can begin to make a whole lot more sense to us in our personal lives and relationship with Christ. We cannot fully live as a living sacrifice to God unless the power of God has transformed our thinking. Ephesians 4.23 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. I believe one of Paul's closest parallels to this concept is found in Romans 8.5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit, what? Set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Believer is called to live by the Spirit by focusing their mind wholly on that which is godly. And this includes every thought, every action, every part of our being. And only when this transformation of the mind happens can we begin to understand and accept the perfect will of God in our lives, what He wants from us. When we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, we're ready to progress and to being that living sacrifice to God, discerning His will and enjoying the journey. Three stages, and I know that scares you because we're 23 minutes, but I promise you this is the short part. Three stages in discerning God's will, which is essential in living this life of worship to God. If we're going to, if we're going to be able to discern the will of God and truth, we're going to have to, first of all, have a readiness for it. We've already addressed this, but I just reiterate it again. We are only ready to discern God's will when our minds have been renewed and, and cast away from the world system and turned to God's viewpoint. When we are there, there is a readiness to begin to discern the will of God in our life. We're only ready when we're forsaken, when we have forsaken the chase of pleasure, possessions, and status, and embrace denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Him. When we shift our thinking from a me-first mentality to an other-first mentality, we're getting closer to being ready of discerning His will. When we're more concerned about losing ourselves in Christ and defending our reputation, we're getting closer of being ready to discerning His will. When we're ready to face persecution for Christ's sake rather than to compromise, to escape it, friends, we're getting getting to the place where we can be that God can show us and speak to us his will in our life. We're ready to discern his will only when our minds have been renewed. Secondly, when, when we have this readiness, it will fi we'll find that there's a, a much better opportunity to have a recognition of his will in our life. Only after we're ready can we then recognize his will. I think many years ago, maybe I shared the illustration of, of the graduation gift that I received. There's, most people would not have a problem with it whatsoever, but uh, I received a, a watch for my graduation, and it was, it was, it was nowhere near a Rolex, but, but uh, it, it did cost a little bit, and it was, it was nice and gold and flashy, and man, it was the best watch I'd ever owned, and, and I kind of liked it, and I remember as we would sit in chapel services there at Pinview, and I was graduating from high school, and I would go into college, and, and as we would be there, I remember, you know, every, every college student needs to have a watch to know how to get to class on time and when to get on time and all of those things. Things. And so I was really going to use this, this piece of machinery. And I remember, man, I just loved it. I, I liked the way it felt. I liked the way it looked. And I remember I wanted everybody else to see that as well. And when chapel service would come and they would be there and we'd be singing, uh, you know, I have settled the question forever, man, I would raise my left hand. All of a sudden, my right hand did not work. It was always my left. You want to know why? Because I loved my watch and I wanted everybody to see it and enjoy it as much as I was enjoying it. I began to feel uncomfortable with something inside of me because of that. Brother Hausman, I tried to explain it away. I thought that was foolish. I thought that's the dumbest thing. And, and man, you know, God is not really worried about a watch. And you know the reality of it is? God is not really worried about a watch. He was not worried about a tie. He was not worried about this, that, or the. You know what he was worried about? He was worried about the thing that it was igniting down inside of me. And I began to feel like maybe I should just put it off or, or get rid of it. And I thought what I'll do is I'll, I'll take it and set it in my, in my dresser drawer and that's where it would be and I'll just keep it right there. And, and I just felt like that wasn't really being obedient to what I felt I needed to do. I just needed to get it, just needed to get it gone. My roommate at the time was Jeff Strait, Kendall's boy, and we were there, and, and his mother had got him a wall razor, which he did not like, a wall electric razor, and, and I liked it. I had one. It was, mine had been broken. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll trade you my watch for that wall razor. My dad and mom who are watching tonight, perhaps if you're watching, I'm sorry, you got the short end of the stick. He got a nice watch. I got a new wall electric razor. 
In my efforts to discern God's will in this situation, I found it easier to recognize the issue of pride because I had allowed God to transform my life by the renewing of my mind, by the way that I viewed things. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want to know God's will, we can know His will. And it's easier to recognize when we have been made ready to recognize it. Was there anything morally wrong with my watch? Absolutely not. But there was something wrong with how it made me feel proud. And God wanted me to get rid of it. It was His will for me. When our minds are focused on Him, it's incredible how easily we might recognize His good, acceptable, perfect will in our life. There has to be a readiness, and if there's a readiness, there's a recognition. And if there's a recognition, when we recognize it, we then finally must be resigned to it. It's one thing to recognize it, but it's a whole other ball game to say, Lord, I am resigned to your will in my life. When God showed me his will about my watch, I didn't need to stand up, and I don't need to stand up and preach against watches. That was for Matt Ellison many years ago. I don't need to make a big deal. I don't need to make a mountain out of a mole. What was it? God was saying, Ellison, this is a problem for you. And I had then to resign to the fact that if I was going to live a life of a living sacrifice to him, I had to be resigned to obey that will in my life. The key to living as a love slave to God is being resigned to his will once it's known to us. While at IHC this past week, I, I had a meal with a man and his wife who, who told me an amazing story. Some time ago, they had, they had met a woman whose life was an absolute mess. She had been a heroin addict, and her life was quickly unraveling, and they witnessed and prayed with her in the time of meeting her, exchanged numbers, and they tried their best to keep in contact with her over time. As she continued to live over time, she, she got into some programs and she kicked her hair, heroin addict and uh, her, her heroin addiction. And, and, and it was shortly after that she found out that she was expecting. Her little girl came into this world, and soon after that, the mother told the story to, to these two folks that she was told she had to get out of her living arrangement ASAP. She didn't know where she was going. She was uh, just recently clean from heroin, and you know that, that you know, when things begin to compound and compound, you might have been able to break free, but if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's easy to slip right back into that. Now she has a, uh, just a little baby girl, and, and her world is crumbling. She has to be out of her place. She was frantic. She was talking to the only Christians she knew, and she was saying, what in the world do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Little did she know that God had been working on this couple in their heart. And they both, in agreeance, had felt that God was uh, uh, allowing those paths to cross for a reason. They began working in their basement, setting up some bedroom furniture, remodeling a few things, and getting it ready just in case, just in case these fillings were accurate. After much prayer and seeking God, they felt that God was leading them to ask this, uh, this lady and her three-month little baby girl to move into their basement until she could get her back on her feet with stipulations that she was still going to go to meetings and she was going to go to church with them and she was going to, you know, there was some stipulations to do so. The woman was ecstatic. Listen, yes, there are risks. We know that. Potential problems, absolutely. Inconveniences from the natural viewpoint, yes. But this couple having been transformed by the renewing of their mind, found themselves at a place recognizing God's will. And they came to a place where they said, Lord, we don't understand this, but we're resigned. If it's what you want, then we are willing to do so. And today, if not today, in the very near future, this week perhaps, she will begin residing with them as they are trying to show Christ to her. Our musicians are coming. Tonight, does this mean that every person needing 
uh, to, to live a life submitted to God needs to go out and find a recovering heroin addict with a three-month-old baby to prove that they're willing to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to God? Does every person need to get rid of their watch? Does everyone have to adapt it or adopt some long to-do list to prove their commitment to God? The answer is absolutely not. It's not about those things. But we must no longer allow ourselves to be conformed to the world system of thinking. We must abandon the chase of pleasure, possession, and status and allow ourselves to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and then be ready to recognize and be resigned to the will of God in our lives. And through this process and through this endeavor, we can truly say, Lord, here is my life. Direct it as you will. And whatever your will is, Lord, I'm okay with that. There's no more excellent way to live than to be wholly surrendered to God's leadership in our life and then be satisfied in whatever path he leads us down. We sang the chorus a little while ago, as the deer pants for the water, so does my soul pant and hunger after you. As our custom on Sunday evening, time of family prayer, before we go back out and face another week in, in uh, the world in which we live, I would like for us just to gather around the front, wherever you are, but if you're invited to the front, the steps, the, the, the altars, the front seats here, and let's pray that God would just help us, that we'd be ready that we would recognize and then be resigned to whatever it is the Lord would have for us in our life. And if we can get in that place and stay in that place, we can live a life that is a living sacrifice that is our reasonable service. Amen? Let's just pray that God would help us. Would you come forward and let's just have a time of closing prayer, those who would like to. If you stay in your, your seat, that is fine. If you have to leave, please do so quietly. But we're just going to spend some time, and we're going to seek the Lord, not only to help us in this area, but that God would give us strength and help as we face another week. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, dear Lord, for your mercy. If it were not for your mercy, Lord, where would we be? We'd have no hope. We would be so, so miserable in our life. We remember the misery in our life without you. But, but Lord, just to, oh, look over these last, uh, uh, last 27 years, dear Lord, and realize the joy and happiness and contentment that we've experienced. Lord, what, what a miserable life life it would be had we not given our heart and life to you. And the reason that it was available is because God, you're a merciful God, rich in mercy. We're thankful for that. We praise you for it. But Lord, our heart's desire as, as a Christian, as a child of God, is that we might live a life, dear Lord, submitted to you. And Lord, we're just asking that as, as a Christian tonight, as your children, that you would help us, dear Lord, in greater ways to discern your will, that we might know what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God, that, Lord, we might know it, we might recognize it, and then, Lord, be resigned to it, that, Lord, whatever you ask, whatever you want, Lord, you've been so good to me. You're so merciful to me. Lord, the answer is yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Lord, we are just so grateful for all that you have done for us, and our heart truly can sing with the songwriter. Lord, as the deer pants after the water brook, so does our heart pant after you. We love you tonight. We praise you for how you're working in my life and how you're, you're helping me, dear Lord. I thank you for it. And, and Lord, if you're helping me, I know you're helping others. And Lord, we ask that we would not brush it off, but we would embrace it and grow closer to you, be more like you. And Lord, we would be the church that you would have us to be, the Christian personally you would have us to be collectively. Lord, may we let our light shine and may we be an example that, that, that mirrors your character and your Christ-likeness. Oh God, we pray. Lord, as we get ready to leave this place and we go back out and face another week, Lord, who knows what we're going to face? We think of so many people, dear Lord, up and down. And Lord, we think of John Shamber just on a roller coaster ride, good one day and just crashing the next. 
Lord, we ask that you would be with those that are going through that. Give them, give them the strength they need. Give them your presence, we pray. May they feel you close and near. Those that are going through surgeries, those that are facing results of testing, Lord, we just ask that you would help. Whatever this week holds, dear Lord, we want you to know our faith is in you. We trust you. We're depending on you to help us every step of the way. Lord, right now we, we might find ourselves on a little plateau, maybe even on a mountaintop experience. Lord, Lord, we know that that could change at any moment, but Lord, we ask that if it does, that you would help our faith to still hold to the Christ of Calvary. Lord, we ask that you would help us, Lord, to leave this place purposing in our heart that God, we're going to be salt and light. We're going to be your ambassador. Lord, to the best of our ability with your help and with your strength. Go with us. Go before us. We know that you are in us. And Lord, as you would help us, we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll give you glory. We're committing this week to you. Your will be done. And as you help us, we'll thank you and praise you for it all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. God is good. Stand, shake hands with each other. You're dismissed. God bless you.